so now uh, so lucius was obviously lucius is a friend who was trying to get the bank loan in the first example we have completely forgot about lucius but now lucius is curious to figure out uh, what happens when you tweak some more parameters of it so before that let's first understand what are some shortcomings of why do you want to even tweak parameters in the first place so the first parameter first shortcoming of decision tree and the first and probably the most foremost and most pronounced uh, shortcoming of decision trees it's extremely prone to overfitting uh, and you can clearly understand why right so if you don't stop your tree and ideally you let it go on splitting till you don't reach a completely homogeneous node or a node with just one particular person uh, you can understand why you are basically then if you're not stopping till then you are basically fitting a model which is extremely extremely uh, overfitted to every single point in the data set right because what happens here is this right so in this example so basically you're keeping on splitting keeping on splitting keeping on splitting till you don't so at, until you don't reach a point where you have a node for each of the particular data set in the example right so that is extremely overfitted you have fitted a model which fits to every data point in the model because you are stopping only stopping when each of the node consists one data point right each of the node consists one data point so that is a model which is extremely overfitted and you can understand why so given that is a scenario uh, you don't want to do that. You don't want to build a model. You don't want to keep on splitting till you reach. So that that kind of a stopping criteria is not only computationally expensive, but it's also very prone to overfitting. So you ideally don't want to split till that level, right? So you want to put some more stopping criteria on the decision tree. So this stopping criteria is basically what is known as pruning. Pruning is basically because in trees, when you're trying to stop their growth, you kind of prune their branches such that the tree is kind of restricted in its height and width, right? So the same concept because it's a decision tree. You're going to put some stopping criteria, which is more than what we have discussed, such that you kind of stop your tree in the middle. You don't let it go grow beyond a level. So we are going to set constraints on the tree side. So now first, let's look at the general structure of the tree. So this is uh, tree nodes, which are not terminal nodes and the blue ones are the ones where a decision has been made and you are splitting them further. So the blue ones are the ones where a decision are being made and the red ones, the circle, the dotted red ones are the circles which are terminal nodes, right? So how you come up with the stopping criteria for terminal nodes, right? So those are the ones which you, how you set up constraints. There's no other way to set up as much constraint on the decision tree as much as saying when, how do you define terminal node? As of now, our intuitive understanding is terminal node is something where you either end up with a completely homogeneous class or something where you have uh, one data point that cannot be basically be split further so until unless you don't reach this two criteria you cannot stop but ideally we see that if you, those are the criteria that is overfitted model so we want to impose certain more criteria on that so now let's think of some what are some by default some what are the some of the ones that you can design by yourself right one is obviously restrict the tree length right basically level to which the splitting so which i've already talked about in a while back so you say that, okay, I just want the tree till depth of two or till depth of three, not more than that. So the three splits in each branch, that's it. I don't want anything more than that. So that's one way to say, uh, one way to set a constraint on tree side. So that how you can do that is called, uh, there is the maximum depth of trees, right? So maximum depth of trees is basically where you say that, uh, there are multiple levels and you say that I only want to go to the third level. So every branch you are only going to split three times. So every all of those splits are basically on the same base, same algorithm. You're going to look for Gini index or entropy, look for the one which minimizes your impurity score. And but the idea is the same, right? So you're going to look at all possible feature splits, reduce the impurity score, but only do it thrice for every branch. That's when you're having maximum depth as three. So you can set this maximum depth in scikit and you can say that, okay, maximum depth five means only five possible splits. Now, what are some other stopping criteria? The first one is minimum samples for a node split. What does that say? Which says that if, what are the minimum number of samples that require to be in a node before, if less, if, which, if there are less than those minimum number of samples, you don't go and split further, right? So that is what this criteria says, minimum samples for a node split. So ideally by default, the minimum sample is one because you cannot split one person into two more nodes. But what ideally you can, 
apart from that you can also set that minimum sample node size to be say some number like 5 or 10 mm -hmm. if you say it to be 5 then what it means that if a node reaches a if there's a child node which is produced and which has only number of samples in that is 4 which is less than 5 then you don't split it further so minimum sample for node split just says that the minimum number of samples that are required for it to be considered for splitting further so the next one is minimum samples for a terminal node which is to say which is slightly different from what we have run so which says this that so suppose you have one node let me explain this via figure so you have one particular node and you are basically looking at the same thing right so you are looking at all possible features trying to see which is the feature that minimizes the impurity score now say you have come up with the best feature f1 right f1 is the one which reduces your impurity by the maximum amount but because of f1 based splitting what ends up happening is here you have a child node which has got sample 5 and the other one has got say 50,000 right based on feature split 1 f1 equals to yes and f1 equals to no you get one child node which has got 5 samples the other child node has got 50,000 samples so what you say is that you say that if for a minimum a split to be considered a valid split there needs to be minimum number of samples in a child node and this what this says is basically if there's so if you set that as minimum sample for split so say you set that up as 10 then you are gonna say that i'm gonna look at the best possible split and if that split produces a child node any child node which has got less than 10 sample i'm not gonna go and go ahead and split that node right so that what this particular feature so this is slightly different from what we just talked about earlier earlier we were talking about one particular node and whether it should be split further based just on the parent node child population right now we are talking about parent node probably your population exits and the minimum threshold but after splitting the child node that gets produced probably has threshold which is lower than what you have already set right so in those cases you don't want to split so there's a there's a threshold for parent node splitting and there's a threshold the second one this particular example minimum samples for a terminal node this basically says that threshold for any node to be even considered a valid node so if there's a if your best possible feature split gives you a node which produces any child node with lower population than minimum samples for terminal node you are not gonna go ahead and split that node that's what it means so max depth you have covered and then the other option is basically setting maximum number of terminal nodes you're gonna say that okay i think uh, there's another way to constrain right so you're gonna say that i think i don't want anything more than 10 terminal nodes so that would automatically put some inherent constraint on the depth of the trees right so those are these are all correlated terms and you can you may or may not impose all of them together you can go ahead with one or you can go ahead with two or you can go ahead with all of them uh, but obviously uh, they are somewhat related right you can understand maximum terminal node if you set a threshold on that you are inherently also setting a threshold on the maximum depth of the tree so keeping that in mind let's move ahead so the second the next constraint is maximum features to consider for a split which is basically uh, a number of so basically this is to not actually constrain the size of the tree but this is more to constrain the computational power that goes into computing because what happens normally is if you're considering all possible feature splits as you have already explained if there are a lot of continuous variable in your data set the number of decision points are a lot more increased right and to do that every time for every possible split is a very big deal right you cannot afford that much of computational calculation so what you do is you say okay you know what every time let's not check for all possible features let's check for a subset of features randomly selected so that's also something that you can go ahead with um, and so that is a broad overall concept so these are some of the thumb rule for setting parameters i'm sure once you go into the scikit api and look for yourself you will be able to find a lot more hyper parameters to play along with try and go through the documentation understand what each of them mean and then basically tune them don't try and just just because these are the ones that have been taught to you don't try and go them and start playing around with them and also one more idea is just don't try and blindly pull, pulling around the knob and checking what happens try and also understand what is happening if you're putting a max depth constraint as well as a maximum terminal node constraint you are kind of playing it a redundant way right because those are inherently related to each other there's no reason why you should put both the constraints so given that is how you tune your hyper parameters uh, those are basically 
the overfitting so these are all ways to tackle overfitting and i have talked about this in the logistic regression class but still for sake of uh, benefit of everyone watching the video right now the reason why how you tackle overfitting is this right you have a training set and then on a validation set you measure the performance to tackle overfitting you basically measure everything on the validation set it could be accuracy it could be auc it could be precision it could be recall whatever measure you're fine with that's your call take a call and measure that on the validation set and by tuning your hyperparameters like max depth and minimum sample split and all of that we have talked in decision tree you basically see what is that combination of hyperparameter which gives you the best performance on the validation set all of this overfitting checking is on validation sets please don't do that on train set so now let's take the example of uh, decision tree right decision tree now with max depth 2 and 5 so how does that affect the affect the performance so we first take a decision tree we define its max depth as 2 and let's yeah so this is a clf1 max depth equal to 2 this is clf2 and this is max depth equals to 5 and then we fit both of those on x train and y train now we see the performance of all of them on test data right as i said overfitting tackling you cannot do on train you have to always measure the performance the performance metric could be accuracy auc you have to take a call on what you want to measure depending on business and other use cases but take the prediction on test data set not on train so here we have taken it on test data set and then we calculate accuracy of clf1 based on the prediction from clf1 model and accuracy clf2 based on prediction from clf2 model and we see accuracy of clf1 model is 0.76 if you remember clf1 was a model which has a max depth of 2 and CLF2 is the max depth of 5. So you see that the one which has max depth of 2 has performed better than model with max depth of 5. And why is that somewhat inherently understandable is because max depth of 5 probably you are fitting a data point to probably fitting a model to every data point. Because you are doing that splitting for a lot more prolonged depth than you are doing it for depth equals to 2. In depth equals to 5, you are probably splitting to that extent where you have a model which fits to every data point or roughly every data point. You don't want to do that, so that's why you kind of want to avoid that and that's why you see max depth equals to 2 performs better in this case. The disclaimer being, don't try and take this as a blanket statement that max depth equals to 5 always performs better than max depth equal to 2. This is completely dependent on the data set that you are measuring, the accuracy metric that you are measuring, how your training has happened, how your testing has happened. In this particular case, we see that obviously max depth 5 has performed not as good as max depth 2. But probably sometimes you could end up with, if you use max depth 2, you could end up with an underfitted model, whereas max depth 5 probably would be a more suitable model in that case. So, in this case, obviously you can see that the models that we had earlier used, right, where the max depth was already set as 10. By default, the max depth of scikit decision trees is set as 10. So you compare that, you have got better accuracy than what you had earlier, which was around 64%. So using Gini index, right? So the default default depth for max depth for scikit is 10. At least that was in earlier versions. I'm not sure what it is current now. And the default criteria, default algorithm for classification is Gini index. Uh, so using Gini index and max depth equal to 2, we got the best accuracy, which was 0 0.76. So now the final part of decision tree, which is what are the advantages of easy decision tree? The first and foremost is it's easy to understand, right? How, how interpretable it is, right? You can clearly see the decision diagram as I've shown you in the slides. And from that, you can easily see that for every given data point, you can see why that decision got made, whatever decision got made. You can clearly see the decision flow, right? So that is extremely important for business perspective because in business, it's tough to go and say that, okay, I think I won't give him a loan because I think his theta one and theta naught and theta three values are very low. Those just make sense. And those are just weights you give to a feature, right? Uh, in case of, in case of decision tree, it's a very clearly explainable structure that this person falls into this bucket, which is a low income, high age, low education kind of a background. And that's why you don't give him a loan, right? It's very easy and interpretable to explain back to business, which is not the case with logistic regression. So that is why it's easy to understand and interpret. Also, it's easy for you to understand, right? How, come on, you can also, ex ex you know, you can also accept this fact that logistic regression was way more 
tougher to kind of build an intuition onto. Decision tree was much more easier. You have a feature, you have an impure node. All you are trying to do the entire algorithm, all the algorithms, just you know, lower the impurity. You have a mixed class at the root node, and you are somehow building algorithm and decisioning such that your impurity goes down as and as you go down the decision tree. And that's very simple. That's something very simple for you to understand, very simple for you to explain others, right? So the second most important part of decision tree is useful for data exploration, right? So how? So basically, if you use, if you see which are the features which have been multiple times used for decisioning, you can gain an idea, okay, probably this feature is really good for, uh, you know, this is something this is very, really important in terms of making the decision. So if you see for a bank loan application problem, you see that age is something that is getting repeated multiple times for is the feature based on which you take splits at multiple levels. So then you know that probably age is a very important criteria while taking a decision on whether a person should be given a loan or not, right? So for all those practical purposes where you're doing feature selection, you can very easily conclude which are the features which are important for this decision making process as compared to features which are not important. So decision tree already provides you that kind of a I'll, that kind of API scikit, sorry, decision scikit implementation of decision tree already gives you that kind of an API for figuring out which is that algorithm, which is that, uh, which are the, what are the feature importance for each of the features. So you can use that directly to compute your feature selection processes as well. And obviously less data cleaning is required. It is because it is not influenced as much by outliers or missing values because and you can understand why, right? Because you are, all you're concerned about is basically lowering the entropy. There's no way you are, the outliers are directly affecting your algorithm, right? So given the, at least in case of categorical classification, in case of continuous classification, right? Continuous regression problems where you're using a decision tree for regression problems. In those cases, while you are calculating variance, probably outliers value in your, uh, in your output probably could affect it but as such in classification kind of tasks your outlier are not really that important and it's more robust to outliers than say logistic regression would be and data type is not a constraint it can handle both categorical and classific categorical and numerical variables that also we have understood how for categorical variables is easy to understand for all possible for every feature split you are going to split it into child nodes for each of the possible classes of the discrete variable or the categorical variable. And for continuous variable, you are going to check for what are the different points at which decision changes. And for each of those points, you are going to check what is that threshold which based on which you get the lowest impurity score, right? So though you can, it can handle both categorical as well as uh, numerical variables. Only thing is in for case of numerical variables, it's a lot more computationally expensive. Uh, so if your data set consists a lot of numeric variables, you have to think of some way to kind of minimize your computational cost because it can really go if because it would ideally be checking for all those points. Uh, so it would be checking for all those points where basically the decision is changing, right? So category for numeric variables, we have already understood it's computationally expensive, but all in all, it can work for both categoric and numeric. So you don't need to really worry about that. Uh, and it's a non-parametric method. So what is a non-parametric method? I have already explained to you. In case of logistic regression, your model was basically a function of theta naught, theta one, theta two, and so on and so forth. Those were, those were the parameters of the logistic regression model. And your entire model building exercise was concerned about finding the best possible parameters, right? Theta, what is the best possible value of theta? What is the best possible value of theta one and so on and so forth? In case of decision tree, there's nothing like that, right? In the entire algorithm, did we even talk about theta naught, theta one, anything, any parameter? It was a simple algorithm. Take a node, split it into parts, take that, split it into parts, take that, split it into parts. There was nothing about maximizing any parameter, right? You, the algorithm was deterministic and there was no concern about finding parameters. So what a non-parametric model essentially means is that there's a decision tree has no assumption about the data distribution overall and the parameter distribution. So given that is a broad overall advantages of decision tree. Now the final thing is what are the disadvantages and because obviously nothing is completely awesome. There are obviously some drawbacks also that come with decision trees. 
Our decision trees are awesome because they're interpretable and all of that. But what comes with interpretable is the cost that it's very prone to overfitting, right? Because it can fit a, we have seen that already, it can fit a data model to each of the corresponding data point, right? And you have to somehow figure, obviously there are ways you can kind of constrain that. You can limit your decision tree growth, but you have to do that manually. There's no automatic way to kind of take care of all of this. You have to do your hyperparameter tuning to make sure it doesn't overfit. Uh, so obviously the first thing is uh, the most important problem with decision trees is that they are prone to overfitting. Uh, decision trees are also unstable in a way because a small variation here and there of the labels and you could completely change how the decision tree looks like because if you change the labels slightly uh, or your age right so say you are splitting based on age and the threshold you have come up with is 60 and so basically people belonging to age 59 is on one side people belonging to age 61 is on the other side now if you change slightly that threshold the entire decision tree could look completely different right uh, decision tree learners also create bias trees if some of the classes dominate it is therefore recommended to balance the data set what is a class what is the imbalance here we are talking about so if you have a data set where people are trying to watch a movie right and now say you have a data set where out of those 50 people, we had initially 26 people who had watched the movie, 24 people who were not like, like to watch the movie. Now instead of 26, 24, we, we, what if we had say 48 people who had watched the movie and only two people don't watch the movie. So that's a, called a class imbalance problem. So in case of imbalance problem where one class is completely dominant over the other class, uh, in terms of frequency, you don't want to go ahead with a decision tree as it is. You probably want to do some uh, tweaks here and there so we'll be talking about what are those tweaks uh, in a lecture couple of lectures down the line but for now just remember this that if you have a lot of imbalance decision trees are not something that would work very good uh, and that is something where we end the session for the day so there are a couple of things that we want to recap on and uh, let's so first up is what is decision trees so we understand what is decision trees they are a non-linear non-parametric easily interpretable way of machine learning supervised machine learning technique you can use it both for classification as well as for regression right and so how does this algorithm inherently work you have for a classification algorithm it basically looks at all possible it the parent nodes so all of this algorithm forget classification or regression the algorithm at the end of the day work like this so you have a root node which has got a lot of impurity and you want to split them out right you want to separate the impurity you want to make nodes which are more purer and you want to keep on splitting such that your nodes become purer down the line right so that's the goal of decision tree that's the aim of decision tree to make to have a start from my impure node and make it more pure as you go down the line right and based on how, what is the impurity measure that you use, you have three possible uh, measures, gene, three possible algorithms for classification purposes, Gini index, entropy, and chi-square. For regression purposes, the one we use normally is reduction in variance. And all of them are concerned with the same fact that you have an impurity which you want to kind of reduce as you go down. So at each node, this is how you take the decision. At each node, consider all possible feature splits. And for all for possible feature splits, you basically choose the feature which gives you the lowest impurity score. That is how we go ahead with the decision tree. Now, advantages of decision trees is this, that obviously they are uh, very interpretable, they are non-parametric, they are non-linear models. Um, and they're easy to understand, right? Easy to understand, easy to explain back. And drawbacks with most of the most important drawback with decision trees are that they are prone to overfitting obviously there are some other small things like they are not stable and they are uh, not really robust to class imbalance but remember the fact that they are easy to understand and they're robust to outliers right outliers and missing value decision trees are completely robust to so with that in mind let's end the session for the day so you know what decision trees are you i would really request you guys to kind of go back to your uh, go back and kind of do experiment on new data sets try out the decision tree see how varying different hyperparameters changes your performance and try and analyze why is that happening why a genie index is performing not as good as compared to a uh, entropy right try and see the decision tree for yourself plot the decision tree given a new data point see the prediction and then figure out what is the path that decision tree would have what is the path that would have been followed for that particular uh data point and why is that probability coming out to be 0.6 right so do all of that at your end 
and that's how you get a more much more better expertise of the subject and that's it log on to gray atoms learning platform to unlock more free content subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for regular updates